Hey guys, have a look at this diagram. This is what we built today. In essence, a complete home network in a virtual environment. There are so many scripts on this channel for OpenWRT for Linux and so on. Many of you want to give OpenWRT or Linux a try, but maybe you don't want to flash your router for this, or you just don't have the hardware available. In order to help you guys to get started and maybe run stuff in a test environment before bringing it to life on real hardware, I thought it might be great to have a test lab. Today we will build this test lab in a virtual environment using software which is available for free. We will build a virtual environment that consists of two OpenWRT routers, a Linux machine and a Windows machine. The software that we will use to achieve this is called VirtualBox from Oracle. It's available for free. Furthermore, we need some images. So first off, here's what we will need. The VirtualBox software, which you can download from Oracle's website. An OpenWRT image for the x86 processor, which you can download from the OpenWRT website. A Linux installer file, I will use Ubuntu or Debian, can be downloaded from a Ubuntu or Debian mirror and a Windows 10 ISO file that we will download from Microsoft. The links to the download locations are in the description. Okay, first let's install VirtualBox. Let me show you in the first screen cam lab session how to download and install it on Windows. In the second lab, I will show you how to install it on Linux. Unfortunately, I can't show you how to do this on the Mac as I don't have a real Mac available at the moment. If you want to skip chapters, please use the time and chapter markers. Installing VirtualBox under Windows is quite straightforward. So if you Google for VirtualBox, the first hit you should get is the virtualbox.org website. And there is this big box that actually tells you to download it. And if I go on the Windows um, distribution link here. It should then go ahead and that's what it does. It, go, it goes ahead and downloads the executable file for Windows from virtualbox.org. Just a short remark here, generally speaking, if you're downloading software from the internet, always make sure you download from a trustworthy source. And of course, in this case, the software vendor is uh, trustworthy in my eyes, at least for the installation of that software. Now, once you've downloaded it, just do a right click on the downloaded exe file and run it as administrator, because we will need to install hardware drivers here and uh, they need administer, administrator privileges. It will then lead you through a couple of dialogues, uh, just uh, give you the options. I left everything by default. It will ask if you want to you know, create shortcuts on a desktop, etc. Just uh, leave the defaults. Now it's giving me a warning here that it will shut down my network interface. That's because I'm connected using RDP to the machine I'm actually installing it on. So if uh, the network interface goes down, of course, I will be disconnected. And then it goes ahead and installs a couple of driver software, such as the driver for the USB is asking you to say OK to that one. So I just accept that and um, then it goes on and installs it and that's pretty much it. So VirtualBox is installed on my Windows uh, machine. You can see the little icon on the desktop at the lower left and it uh, goes ahead and starts and that's pretty much it. If you are on Ubuntu 20, the easiest way of installing VirtualBox is actually using apt, just by typing apt install virtual box. So that would actually pull version 6.1.10, which is quite up to date. So that would work. If you wanted to install it on Debian or Ubuntu 18 on Debian, even on Buster, I haven't seen virtual box as an installable APT or Debian package. If you are on Ubuntu 18, this would install version 5.2. So that's definitely too old. If you have a doubt which Ubuntu version you're on or which Debian version you're on, the easiest is just to type cat. So that will output the content of a text file. And the text file we want to look at is slash etc slash issue. And that actually contains the version of uh, Debian or Ubuntu, which you are using. On other Linux distributions, the best way to download VirtualBox is actually you go to the virtualbox.org 
website. So if you go to the download section here, it will actually give you a couple of options such as downloading it for the Windows host or OS X or Solaris or in our case, click on the Linux distributions link and here you get links for the various distributions. So the whole Oracle, Red Hat, CentOS family here, then the Ubuntu Debian family and the RPM based uh, dialects such as OpenSUSE or Fedora. So if you were on Ubuntu 18, there's actually, or even on Ubuntu 20, you may do it like that, of course. If you, there's actually two possibilities to download it. You just click on that link and what that will do, it will just download a .deb, so a Debian software package, which you could then install using the package dpkg. Or alternatively, they give additional instructions on how to install VirtualBox on Linux. And basically what they instruct you to do here is they add their own software repository to the list of APT sources. And there is a couple of keys to download, etc. And then you can just install it using APT because APT would actually know about the Oracle or virtualbox.org repositories and then pull it from there. I just want to make you aware of two or three things when you install VirtualBox on Linux. The first thing is when you have VirtualBox installed, there is a couple of modules that are loaded and those are actually kernel modules. Let me just list them by using lsmod and I'm not interested in all the modules, just the ones that start with VBox. So as you can see, there is three modules loaded. Basically the kernel driver for the whole virtualization layer, that's the largest one. And then there is uh, network drivers. Now, those are, as I said, kernel modules and hence they are dependent on the kernel version. So if you update Ubuntu or Debian, then how is this going to work? Actually, these drivers, they use the DKMS system and that means that they are installed basically as source and they are rebuilt once you update the kernel to a newer version. So if I just type DKMS status, I can actually see the various drivers, the various hardware drivers. You can see there is a driver for my tablet, there's a driver for my graphic card, there's a driver for my, for my Wi-Fi uh, USB stick. And whenever I inst and there is the VirtualBox drivers, of course, and whenever I install a new kernel, so you can see my kernel history here, uh, going from 5.4.0.28 to dash 51. Whenever I update a kernel version, it will actually go and recompile those sources. And uh, then you should have the up-to-date modules again in, in your kernel installed. So there shouldn't be any issues with that. Just so that you know that there are modules loaded which are kernel based or hard, close to hardware drivers and they need to be recompiled. But this is done automatically whenever you update the kernel version using the integrated Debian or Ubuntu software update mechanisms. Cool. We have VirtualBox installed and can now go ahead and configure it. Just one quick troubleshooting tip. If you can't start VirtualBox or, on a, or if you can't start a virtual machine, very often it's related to a BIOS setting called Hypervisor Virtualization VX64 or similar. This needs to be switched on in your BIOS. Now, if you look at the diagram here, you can see that we want to have two networks. The LAN, so our internal network, and the WAN, the internet. All this will happen inside the virtual environment, inside the virtual box. Let me show you in the next screen cam lab how to configure the networks in VirtualBox. In order to modify the network settings in VirtualBox, you need to click on this little tool icon and then on network, and it will then show you the VirtualBox host only Ethernet adapter. That's actually our virtual LAN adapter. And if I click on properties here, you can see it's in the dot 56 dot x range and the address of the host is 56 dot one. I suggest we change that to 99 dot two and I'll explain that in detail in a second. So let's change the IP address range of that adapter to 99 dot something and give the virtual box host the dot two address. 
also one thing we should do here is switch off DHCP functionality. So I do not want that VirtualBox adapter to actually give away IP addresses for the LAN. Now the reason we changed this from the 56 to the 99 dot something range and also gave you the dot two address is that I will have an edge router. I will have a router inside my virtual LAN and that router should be giving away DHCP addresses. And if I add a machine and it gets a 56 dot something address, I know that it comes from the virtual box DHCP server, but I don't want this to happen. But I've seen VirtualBox behave badly with respect to that, meaning that I sometimes had to restart VirtualBox because it did not honor that setting. When I removed DHCP, it, it still gave away IP address. So that's the reason. Okay, now we have a virtual LAN and a virtual WAN or internet inside VirtualBox. Let's build our first machine, which will actually be our main router here. That will be the gateway between the virtual LAN and the virtual WAN or internet and also provide IP addresses to all other machines in the virtual LAN. The first thing that I always do when I make something around OpenWRT is that I Google for OpenWRT and then a keyword describing what I want to do. In my case, it's VirtualBox. Usually, and that's the case here as well, the first hit is on the OpenWRT project pages. That is definitely one of the great things where that project stands out. It's just so well documented. So there is a page on installing OpenWRT in VirtualBox, which has all the details that we need. The page links to the OpenWRT on x86 hardware how-to page. So let me just open that page in another tab. I might need it to look things up. On top of that, I open the download page in another tab because we will need to download the right images from there. For this exercise, I will use a stable version. So I click on the link for the stable release builds. I want to use the latest version, which is 19.07.4. I then click on the targets link in order to get the download images for the right hardware platform, which is of course x86, because that's the architecture today's PCs are made of. Now, there are a couple of sub targets here. And if you're unsure, you can quickly check back to the x86 how to page and see what these are all about. And as we can see here, the one to use is the 64 subdirectory because I have a 64 bit machine. Okay. Getting back there and here I can see again a lot of choices. The one we want is the combined EXT4 image because that one has the fewest limitations. With EXT4 we can easily grow the image as we need and install other software on the router later on. Cool. So let me just download that gzip file and store it on my PC. Now. Usually on a real hardware router, you would just flash that image using the web interface, but we need a format that VirtualBox understands. So we have a couple of things to do with that gzip file be before we can use it in VirtualBox. First thing that we need to do is unzip the image file. In order to do that, I have downloaded 7-zip and I'm extracting the image file using 7-zip. Now, just peeking back to the VirtualBox how-to because I need to actually convert that image file using the VBox manage command. Here is the complete command line. Let me open a command prompt and actually type that command in or copy paste it from the website. Now on Linux, the VBox manage command is in the path, meaning that you can just type it as it is shown on the OpenWRT how-to page. But on Windows, you need to specify the path explicitly. VirtualBox is in the C program files Oracle VirtualBox subdirectory. So I need to specify that explicitly on Windows. Also, as you can see that the command as specified on the OpenWRT how to page does not work because the asterisk wildcard does not seem to be interpreted correctly. So I just specify the image, na image file name explicitly as well. Great, that finally worked. And VBox Manage tells me that it has successfully converted the image file into a VDI file, 
which we can later integrate into the VirtualBox image. Awesome. So let me create that new virtual machine in VirtualBox. I call it OpenWRT Edge Router. It's a Linux machine and I select 2.6 or later 64-bit as a version. Next, I need to tell VirtualBox how much RAM it should allocate to that image and seriously, 512 megabytes should be plenty for a little router. On the next screen, I need to add the disk image file which we have just converted. But I realized that I have made a mistake because I converted the file in the download subdirectory but I want it to be somewhere else. So for the time being, I tell VirtualBox to create the machine without a disk and I will add it later. Also, the image is quite small but memory might be an issue on a hardware router but not on my virtual machine. So I check back to the how-to page, copy that VBox manage command which I can use to actually grow the disk image. I will grow it to 512 megabytes, which again should give me plenty of space for extensions. Before I move on, I need to move the openwrt.vdi file from the downloads directory to the subdirectory where the virtual machine will reside. Here we go. Back to the VirtualBox config. First thing I need to do is go to the tools, then media and see if the VDI file in the download directory is still there and just delete it. Next, I'll just add the correct disk file. Now I can go into the settings of the edge router image and tell it to use that hard disk image. While I'm in here, I can also quickly check the network parameters. If I want OpenWRT to work well out of the box, then I need to give it the LAN adapter as the first adapter, so that's my host only adapter. The second adapter will connect to the internet and here I select bridged adapter. And I have of course to pick the right physical card for my laptop. Cool. That should be it. Let's fire this machine up by clicking on the green start button. Open WRT boots as expected. Now, you remember we set the LAN adapter to the .99 address range and the reason I set my virtual box host to the 99.2 address is because I want this router to have the 99.1 address. I just need to tell it about it, because by default an OpenWRT router has the 192.168.1.1 address. I can't use the web interface or Lucy to do this, because I can't reach the machine on the network yet. But I can do this on the command line directly here in the VirtualBox console. The command to do this is UCI. That's basically the command line interface into OpenWRT. If I type UCI show network, it shows me all the network parameters. And what I want to change is the network.lan.ipaddr parameter, which I set to 192.168.99.1. UCI show tells me the parameter has been taken, but in order to apply it, I need to type UCI commit. Great, I will just reboot the router in order to make sure that it comes up properly with the right interfaces, etc. Okay, the router has rebooted and checking the IP address of the interfaces with IP ADDR shows me an address from my physical LAN on the Ethernet 1 adapter and the 99.1 address on the BR LAN adapter. Cool, as expected. Just trying if I can ping the 99.2 address of the host, that works and also as I have bridged my physical adapter, I should also be able to ping a host in the Internet. Let me try Google. 
Yep, that works. So that means that I should now be able to open the router's web page or Lucy. Let me give this a try. Awesome. The page opens and on the status page I can see that it's running in VirtualBox on an Intel i7 and it has roughly 500 megabytes of disk. Let's check the network interfaces. All up, all working. Neat. Let me shut down the machine and take a snapshot for later. Great, this went well. Our virtual network is growing and now we can install additional machines into it. Let's install a second OpenWRT router inside the LAN. In real life, the first router would be your ISP's router connecting you to the internet and the router we install now is that old router which you have in a drawer or a box and which you're digging out when you do stuff such as adding a camera or a hard disk to build a cheap NAS. There are, of course, videos available on this. I have put a, a card up here so that you may watch them by clicking on that little info icon up here. Another great thing with the virtual environment is that we can easily clone machines. That means that if we need a second machine with the same operating system we just do right click clone on an existing one. I'm cloning my edge router here and rename the clone to OpenWRT internal router. As this is going to be a new machine in the same network, it needs to get a new MAC address as well for all adapters. I make this a full clone again as it's going to be a totally separate machine. And I will also clone everything including the snapshots. Just make a full copy. As this machine shall only be connected to the LAN and not to the internet directly, I simply remove the second network adapter. Let me do that quickly. Go into the settings, network and remove the second adapter. Next let me start it because we need to change the LAN interface from fixed IP to DHCP. The machine that we cloned from has the 99.1 address but I want the edge router to dynamically assign an IP address to this machine. I'm doing this again with UCI on the command line by switching the protocol of the LAN interface to DHCP and committing the changes. Quickly checking with UCI show I can see that the protocol has been changed to DHCP. Perfect. Let me reboot the router. While the internal router reboots, I will also fire up the edge router because this is the machine that has the DHCP server. Once the edge router will be up, I will connect to its web interface because there is a status page where I would be expecting the internal router to show up as a DHCP client. Let me quickly connect to the edge router, checking the status page. But nothing happens. Why? I think I know, but let me check. I'll go over to the internal routers console and check if it has received an IP address. Yes, it has, but not from the 99.x range. It has received a 56.x address from the old VirtualBox address range. This is what I meant in the third lab when we changed the IP range to 99.x, you remember? I can see that VirtualBox still is active as DHCP server, even though I told it not to be a DHCP server. So we need to shut all images down using the halt command. I then go back to the VirtualBox network settings, remove the DHCP server tick box again and restart VirtualBox.
that should have fixed it. Okay, same procedure once more. Starting VirtualBox, starting the two images. First the edge router. Then connect to Lucy, watch the status page. Then start up the internal router and hopefully it should appear on this status page. It boots and here it is. It got assigned an IP address out of the 99.x range for my edge router. Yes, finally. The last thing that I want to do here in order to make things a bit cleaner is that I also rename the OpenWRT routers on the system page, just so that I can better tell which one does what. I'll do the same thing on the internal router. Connect to its IP address with the web browser. Go to the system submenu and also change the host name to OpenWRT to OpenWRT internal. If I now reboot it, then it should show up with a new host name on the Edge router status page. Here it is. Works as expected. Perfect. Let's take a snapshot at this stage. I can also delete the inherited snapshot from the original image. Just type in the description. And then delete the original snapshot. I will not need it anymore. The edge router now has a snapshot and the internal router as well. Quickly checking back on the network interfaces, they show up with the right address in Lucy. All working, I'm happy. Excellent! We now have two OpenWRT routers in our network. One is the gateway to the virtual internet and the other one is just an internal device. Maybe a dump access point or the router that actually runs software such as Samba or OpenVPN or WireGuard VPN or maybe does VPN bonding etc. Before we go further into detail on what you can do with every single machine, let's add some other images. I will not show how to install Windows or Ubuntu etc. in VirtualBox. There are already many tutorials available for this. But hey, if you want me to do videos on those, drop me a comment. In a nutshell, the way you do this is by adding the installation ISO file as a virtual DVD drive. Create a new virtual hard drive check on all the other parameters such as CPU and memory and maybe do some additional stuff like you need to do for example for Mac OS. And then start the machine and go through the installation process. The main difference or particularity in adding machines to our virtual network here is that if we give them a network interface we just need to make sure that they only get the virtual box host only network. Because we want them to be in the LAN and the VBOX Net Zero is our virtual LAN network. All internet access shall go through our Edge router. I'll quickly show how to do that in the next screen cam lab. All that I'm doing here really is uh, that I select an existing image and I'm adding it to the UI by using the add command. I have copied these images over from a different installation. And what I need to do next with every single one of these images is just go to the settings and um, check that the first network adapter is the host only adapter. Let's change that and remove a second adapter if ever it would exist. And I do that for all the images. This way I will be sure that they will be in the LAN. Awesome! So now we are starting to have a real virtual home network here. We have two routers and I have three machines running Windows, Debian and Mac OS. You can now take snapshots of all these machines so that you can at any time revert to the current state. 
Those snapshots are a really great thing. For a testing environment, it means that you really don't need to be afraid of breaking anything, as you can always revert. Great. Last but not least, if we look at the different videos on this channel and the various concepts that I have proposed so far, let's see what we can run on which machine. If I wanted to test, let's say, the home VPN script on OpenWRT and access the router from the internet, then all I would have to do is take one of these machines, which I want to use as a client, and just move them from the LAN to the WAN by just changing the network from VBOXnet to Bridged. Now it's not inside, but outside of the network, and I can, for example, use this Windows machine, add the WireGuard client on it, and configure my router for port forwarding and so on. Once I'm done, I just revert to the snapshot and everything is clean again as it was before. Other videos and scripts that I have proposed and that you can test would be, for example, the video on building your own VPN service. You could just move the Linux image to the WAN and use it as a virtual VPS. In fact, it's just a Linux machine in the internet, very much like your VPS. Let's do a last screen cam lab and see how we could, for example, use one machine and let's say use the Wi-Fi and the Ethernet from my physical host PC in order to test the VPN bonding stuff. For the VPN bonding, we basically need a Linux machine. So I'm taking this Debian image here. The machine needs to have two network connections in order to bond them together. So what I do here is that I go to the network settings of that machine and then bridge my Ethernet adapter as adapter 1 and my Wi-Fi as adapter 2. Let me quickly start up the image and see what it looks like inside of the virtual machine. The Debian image starts up and once it's running I just want to get into a terminal window and have a look at the network adapter settings. In the terminal window I type IP ADDR in order to see if we have been assigned IP addresses and to my surprise I only get an IP address on the first adapter but not on the second one. So what went wrong? Yes, the second adapter is a Wi-Fi adapter on my host but appears as an Ethernet adapter in my guest. So I need to check on my host if I'm actually connected to any Wi-Fi and it turns out that I'm not. No problem. Quickly connecting to my guest network in order to get a different IP address range. Here we go. And checking back into the Debian guest. If I type IP ADDR, then you can see, actually, I think you can't see much. Let me make this a bit bigger. Here we go. Typing IP ADDR, dang, the other way around. Here we go. I can see the two IP address ranges assigned, one from my LAN and one from my guest network. I could now use a Wi-Fi hotspot and run the VPN bonding guest on this image. So as you can see, we can do virtually anything in this virtual world. I will provide separate videos on each one of those scenarios. That means a virtual lab video for WireGuard, one for the VPS and one on testing the VPN bonding. So please make sure that you subscribe in order to not miss out on those. Guys, before we wrap up, let me do a quick call to action here, please. If you are watching videos on my channel more often, then you might have noticed that I have slightly changed the format of the video here. From the comments, which I get from many of you, it became apparent that the format which I'm using at this very moment, that is me standing and talking here and showing graphics on this side, does not necessarily work very well for everything. Also, some of you told me that I should focus more on close-ups and screen cams to make it easier to follow through. So, first off, many, many thanks for these comments. They are very valuable for me as otherwise, if I wouldn't get them, it would just be me guessing what you like. The new format is inspired by a demo methodology called Tell, Show, Tell. That means I'll tell or explain what we will do in front of the green screen with the beautiful animations and graphics, then do it in a close-up or screencast, then tell or explain again what we just did. Please let me know in the comments if that format works for you. Guys, please leave me a comment. 
I'm constantly seeking to improve not only the content, but also the way I bring it across to you. Because it's obvious that I want to grow my channel and that I want more people viewing my videos. But ultimately, this only works if the videos provide value to you. I hope you know that I do appreciate your feedback. Join me on Sundays on Discord for video chat or screen sharing if you have questions. Contact me on Discord or Facebook Messenger or Reddit if you have questions or remarks. If you like the video, please leave me a thumbs up. Last but not least, if you want more, please do subscribe and also click that bell or notification icon. Guys, many, many thanks for watching, liking, commenting and subscribing. Stay safe, stay healthy. Bye for now.